Hello and welcome to the Field Days podcast. We have a brand new guest today. I'm happy to welcome to the show Jason Lapardis. Did I say that right? Hi, right, man. You're spot on. Some people call me Luke. <laughs> Lapardis works. Well, I can tell you right now, we're gonna have a good time today. I've had a, just a couple conversations with uh, with Jason, and we've uh, I've I've done a lot of laughing and giggling and stuff. This guy's a is is a funny guy, and we're gonna have a great conversation today. And, and uh, Jason is the Turkeys for Tomorrow. Director of Business Operations and Partnerships. And what I'm having him on here today, and you can maybe you have a BS and an MS in wildlife management and forestry from the University of Tennessee um, with a background, a certified wildlife biologist, um, and owns a, a wildlife and land management group, uh, LLC. So what I have Jason on here in particular to talk about is is a topic. I'm anxious, you know, we have a lot of topics that I would consider, I don't consider myself an expert in anything, but more knowledgeable. This is a topic that I've wanted to talk about for a while. And this is, this is timber stand improvement, things we can do with our timber and especially cover, you know, a lot of guys are listening because we, we want to hold mature bucks. We want to shoot big bucks. And we're going to talk about just how important cover is and the things you can do on your property. So uh, Jason, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Hey, brother. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to having a fun conversation. And uh, anytime we're talking about habitat management, I'm always in. Yep. Awesome. And I'm a little nervous because Jody Holbrook's uh, recommended this guy. Oh. So I don't, I don't know maybe what I'm getting <laughs> myself into. But well, 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 you know, it's it's that uh, the Alabama connection, right? I mean, I, I'm an old, old cat originally from Alabama. And so I think there's just that you know, we, we just got sweet home in us. That's all there that's is to right. it. That's right. That's right. So, so yeah, and we're going to let, Jason's going to talk a little bit about his, his Turkey uh, foundation at, at the end and explain to people what that is as well. So that's going to be interesting to, because we got Turkey season coming up. I know I, I love Turkey hunting, so we can, we can talk a little bit of Turkey hunting, but we're going to get into the, the timber stand improvement. But first we're going to just take a, a quick break here. Thank a couple of our sponsors. We'll be right back. My name is Jason Say from Northwest Pennsylvania, and I've been blessed over the last seven years to shoot some really good bucks here in PA. And there's one thing in common with every buck that I've shot, and that is Whitetail Institute food plot seeds. Anybody that tells you that all food plot seeds are created equal, that couldn't be farther from the truth. And I encourage you, check out the difference. Visit whitetailinstitute.com and see for yourself. There's nothing more I love than chasing big bucks. And one of the biggest game-changing products for me and making me more successful is Moultrie Mobile Cellular Trail Cameras. Anybody knows big mature whitetail, especially in high pressure states like Pennsylvania, they're not going to put up with much from humans. So the best thing we can do is stay out of the woods, stay out of that property when it gets close to hunting season. And the Moultrie Mobile Cellular Trail Cameras have been a game changer for me. They have affordable plans, great cameras. I encourage you to check out the entire line at MoultrieMobile.com. Okay, Jason, so we're back and let's let's jump right into it, okay? And and we were talking a little bit before the recording here and, and I was telling you how I do a lot of property consulting. And you know, before I go out to any property consult, I always insist on having a phone call because the first thing I wanna tell somebody is, listen, if you're looking for a dude to come in and tell you to start cutting your trees down, I'm not that guy, <laughs> you know? I'm, I, I don't wanna come in and, and, you know, cause you can, you can hurt your property and things like that. But what I've said to guys, and, and I'm going to let you get into this and tell me if I'm right or wrong. And I've looked at a lot of properties, a lot of properties that are all in different stages, right. You know, where, you know, they have real mature hardwoods wide open, um, other places where it was just select cut. I was in a property the other day that was clear cut. And I always tell guys, you know, I'm here to talk to you specifically about, uh, what I do, and that's hopefully shooting and holding big mature whitetail, you know, and, and when I have been to those properties, I said, I'm not going to tell you to select cut this clear cut this. What I can tell you is I've never seen a property that was hurt from a whitetail perspective, right? From a whitetail perspective that was either clear cut or select cut because man, it grows back thick, gnarly, nasty. But then I follow that up with, um, you know, I'd encourage you to to talk to a timber company, you know, and and have, a, you know, a, and we'll talk a little bit more about how to go about that. We were talking about before the show, but I just wanted to ask you, am, am I giving a guy the right advice? Can it can a select cut or a clear cut actually hurt you when it comes to, to deer habitat or does it always help? I tell you what, I mean, um, yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm going to throw the angle at you. Right. And so I'm going to give you an example I remember working with a landowner. I was down in Southwest Georgia and he called me up and he said, Jason, I heard, I need to talk to you. Like you, you, you're here for the critters. And I'm like, yes, if you're trying to grow deer, turkey, quail, you name it, we need to talk. And so he said, Hey, I had this logger come to me and said, Hey, 
um, I know you want to grow some deer, and so I'm going to clear, clear cut your property. And I said, well, let's talk about this first, right? And so uh, the conversation led on to, well, how many acres you have? 750 acres. I'm like, oh, well, that's that's a pretty good chunk, you know, about a square mile. That's great. I said, what do they want to do? He said, well, the first year they're going to come in and cut half of it. And then a, a few years later, they would come in and cut the second half of it. And I said, okay, well, that seems good, but um, are you trying to get dollars off of this or what are you trying to do? And then when I started going into it, all of a sudden I realized that just a big clear cut is not exactly what he needed and not at the value that was presented to him as well. So yes, uh, anytime you can put sunlight to the ground, it's going to be good for wildlife, especially deer, because they're, they're not up in the top of the tree trying to eat the brush down, right? But That's right. if you manage it correctly, if you do the, the correct type of selection, so to speak, even a clear cut um, in some cases, it can be fantastic. So what we end up seeing on this particular example is I went out there and I said, well, hey, why would we clear cut when we could thin these woods out? I can get you just as much money as what you were told for a clear cut and we can retain the quality hardwoods that we want for whitetail and set you up some really nice spots, these little openings around the ridges where there's some juxtaposition between habitat types, some things that you may not have thought about yet. And all of a sudden he's like, so you're telling me that I don't have to cut all my timber? I'm like, no, sir. We're going to remove about 40% of your timber. And you're basically going to have the same amount of money as you just got told, but you're going to have some great places to hunt. And so he was just mind blown. And so we went out, laid that out. And, uh, and it was really cool to see it all come together. And even working with him going, well, hey, have you thought about wanting to hunt in this spot? You know, and he's like, oh, this is always like a saddle. I'm like, hey. Let, let's talk about how we make these fingers happen with the woods. And so there's always a way to do it. And so, yes, clear cuts can be good, the right size, um, but not just to go out there and blanketly do it without any forethought. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, and, and so it, and that's why I tell the guys, you know, so I'll give you the scenario of, of what I in the ideal scenario when I when I talk to guys and that I've had the chance to work with. I love going into a property where a guy says, OK, we want to make this better you know, we're willing to select or timber or, or clear cut a section or whatever we need to, to do. This is, this is about whitetail. So I always like that when I get to go in first. Right. And, and I tell guys this, you know, if, if you're looking at your property and you're thinking about, man, covers a big issue on my property. And I, I say this too. I don't understand if, if, even if say you have some wide open, really mature hardwoods, why not select cut those, right? You know, why not get, you know, why not do this just even regardless, you know, if, if, if you can get some value off the property, but just looking at it from a, from a whitetail perspective, you know, I love to go into a property and, you know, a guy says, Hey, I'm willing to do whatever here, whether it's select cut, you know, clear cut. So I'll go in there then and say, just like you talked a little bit about before I'll, I'll go and I'll really look at the property. And so, and I have in my mind, okay, there's going to be a timber company in here. That's got all the equipment, right? You know, they got the dozers and they got this and they got that and they can clear these plots way easier than you and I can with a, with a couple chainsaws and, you know, and a lot of manual labor. So I always tell guys, listen, I like to come out first, lay out the property where I want the food plots, where I want the entrance and exit. You know, these, these timber companies, a lot of times they'll work with you and, and give you a good entrance and exit wherever you want it. Not all the time, but I tell guys too. So let me come in first, you know, lay this all out where we want these, where we kind of really want the thick cover and things like that. And then, then talk to the, talk to the timber company, you know, and have them come in. And when I say this, and I told this to you before, I always tell guys, cause they're not real sure they've never done it before. Talk to two or three timber companies. That's you right. know, and, and, and you might say, Hey, you know, I want four plots cleared out and I want, you know, three access points and one timber company may say, well, you know, we're, we're not going to do that or they're not, you know, and, and, but I can tell you they're, they're competing for your business. They, absolutely they make money off the amount of timber they get on your property. So they're competing for your business. You can say, Hey, this is, this is what it's going to take if you want to get my business, you know, and, and obviously you want to make as much money as you can, but then also who's going to work with you on your property plan that you have. And, and, and do you like, just let me ask you, cause that's, that's what I've told every one of my clients and they've done that. And, and we've been successful doing it that way. Like we've, we've really had a lot of success doing that, save them a ton of work, ton right? Of like, yep. you know, hiring somebody to come in and clear all this. It's just, Hey, while they're in here doing this, let's do this, you know, and set it up. So would you look at something like that? Is that the ideal way to go about something, you know, timber stand, you know, improvement like that when you're looking at a, a property and a, a, a whitetail plan overall? 
Absolutely, man. I mean, it's it's all about the first steps, getting to know the landowner, understanding exactly what their needs are, and then, you know, forming that plan. And if you do that correctly, then when you start inviting people in, it can be really good. And so I, I tell everyone, if anyone comes up to you and says, hey, my buddy's the best logger ever. That's this who needs to do this for you. I always say, no, d- do not listen to them. Throw that out the window. Let's move on. And a lot of people are going to chastise me for this, but I'm being really honest. I've worked, I probably worked with over a thousand landowners, right, uh, over the years. And and what I've seen is oftentimes I'm kind of like the cleanup crew. I come in behind and something's already happened. I'm like, oh man, I wish I would have been here a year ago or two years ago. I could have really helped you. And so oftentimes it's those kind of like, well, hey, here's a deal. The best opportunity is to get out there and go, well, hey, this is what I want to do and would love to have you come in. So you need to really have, whether it's a consultant forester or consulting wildlife biologist up front to lay this out. And I'd like to get three to five bids um, on your timber if you're going to try to remove it. And then trying to be very creative with the type of timber that's there, merchandising timber. I don't want to go in, way into the weeds here, but merchandising timber is so important because you can increase your value while also improving your habitat, depending on what the markets are doing. And so trying to keep your ear out on the market, uh, reaching out, talking to several people is so important because when you merchandise, instead of going, well, hey, I'm going to have one guy come in, he's just going to cut everything. Well, let's be creative. Maybe we have multiple individuals coming in, merchandising certain types of wood, um, and it may be some furniture grade stuff. It may be that we have some really high quality timber hardwoods that we're trying to remove a little bit of it out to make a little bit of money, but then retain some really nice mass producing species that we know it's going to be good for whitetail. Because, man, I don't know about you, but if I could have white oaks from left to right on my property, buddy, I would. But at the same time, I do like to drink a good bourbon. So maybe I want to sell one or two of those for a barrel, right? And so yeah. uh, so it just depends on the layout Um what the tree composition looks like, et cetera. And I'm going to be honest with you, there is no cookie cutter approach to any of this because every single property I've ever been to is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you the the part on acorns. I have a love hate with acorns, right? So I'm a big food, <laughs> I'm a big food plot guy. Yeah. And for some reason, magically, when I get a big acorn drop, the deer don't like my food plots as much anymore. <laughs> so I live, I've always been like, man, if I took all these oaks out of here, they'd be on my food plots all the time, but now, you know, in, in oh, diversity yeah. is good and you want to have that. But I can tell you it was a couple of years ago, you know, we have a lot of acorns and, and oaks and we had a, we didn't have a good drop and the deer were on my food plots from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, they were eating turnips at, in the beginning of October, which had never happened. Never before. So I'm like, man, I like it when we don't have acorns. <laughs> this, is, this is good, but, but no, you know, and every, everything's different and in, in how you do it. And, and there's, you know, before I get into, I, I want to get in to have you talk a little bit to guys, the difference between a, a select cut and a, and a clear cut, you know, sure. and, and the, sure. some of the benefits and things like that. But first, what I wanted to talk about was, you know, in your opinion, and I tell guys, and I stress this all the time, just the importance of cover on your property. And again, this is, if we're talking big, mature whitetail, and you know, if you want to kill big, mature bucks, and I, I tell everybody, every big buck I've shot, there's been two things in common. And it's been, you know, it's it's been on a food plot, but it's been between a destination source and thick, thick cover. You know, yep. I mean, thick, gnarly, nasty. Those big bucks, are not, you know, I have guys all the time say, oh yeah, you know, we got corn, we got soybeans, we got, you know, we got all this and, you know, we don't really have a lot of cover and I get lots of big bucks at like two in the morning, you know, but I never get any in daylight, you know, and, and they're like, well, what can I do? And I said, we, you need some cover, you know, I mean, I don't even have to come look at the property yet. If you got, if you have no cover on the property, that's what's going to happen. You're going to have a nocturnal property. Those big bucks just aren't, aren't going to be there. So the importance of cover is, is crucial. So w- when I do consults, I love when I, when I have the initial phone conversation, the guy says, ah, I got tons of cover. The whole property's thick as all get out because cover problems are a longer term problem, right? We can go mm-hmm. anywhere and get food in. You know, I, I can yeah. get in there and, and we can get a food plot plan in and we can get food in that year. If you have a lot of cover issues, this might be a couple years, three years before you really have this fixed. So I just wanted to let you talk a little bit, you know, in your opinion, the, the importance of cover and you know why, why we tell guys it's so important if you and if you do have a property that is limited in cover what are you going to do to improve that cover 
Yeah, I tell you what, man, it's always identifying what's the most limiting factor on your track to improve it to get everything you need. And and I'll be honest with you, if we're, if we're talking about really trying to grow quality whitetails, it is cover um, by far. I've been to so many tracks and people are like, man, I love being able to see a long ways. I'm like, well, I know you do, but that deer, <laughs> he does not like to be seen, especially as they put a little age on them. Because you don't, you don't start killing, you know, these kind of deer, right? until you start getting good cover. And so, um, I mean, that's, that's just how it is. And so for me, it is to try to lay out your landscape of what you want this to look like and to really try to stay out of some of those areas. And I always look at anything from cover, cover to transitional kind of corridors that get them there safely. And the least that you bump these deer in these kind of areas you improve the likelihood that when you finally take that day to sit and stand with the conditions are right, that deer's going to be in front of you. And so yeah. it's, it's kind of a well-executed plan is, is why I look at it. So yeah, if I'm looking at most tracks just for deer, it is hundred percent covered is probably one of the most limited factors out there. Food, you're spot on. There's a bunch of food everywhere. I mean, the beautiful thing is with food plots and what you guys do, you're able to put in some really high quality food plots and, it's fantastic, especially on those harsh years where m maybe we have a mass failure, maybe we have a drought, uh, some other things. And these food plots are basically critical um, to keep those nutritional values very high, that, those vitality rates, as they call it. So that's very important. But if I had to lay out uh, what to do, man, I'd have some areas of cover and, and I just wouldn't touch them. But you may have to go in periodically to do something to maintain it because once you – create that early successional habitat, that early weed habitat that's really good for whitetails and a bunch of other species, it just doesn't stay there for a long time uh, unless you go out and really thin the woods out. So let's say we had a small, what I'd call, and I'm not going to details of all kinds of different cuts because it, it, let's not overcomplicate this. We're going to take, take out a few trees, maybe a small patchwork clear cut and uh, maybe an acre in size. An acre can hold some of the best deer, right? You don't have to cut your entire track to say, hey, I got a big clear cut, but just a small cut and then maybe thinning out the woods around it where you have these transition areas. And if you get really want to get into it, you can lay out a pathway. And I've done this as well, where we thin out everything really heavy to certain food plots and openings. And the reason why we do that, because I know these deer are going to bed here once we make this, and I know they're going to cover, go left to right and go right to this area. And if we can try to stay out of it, stay at a distance and not bump these deer, man, yeah. it's good. It's really yeah. good. And, and when you talk big bucks, that's your only, you know, if you want to consistently shoot big bucks, <clears throat> you better really be focusing on your access, your exit, how you're getting yes. in, how you're getting out. <laughs> they're only going to, they're only going to put up with so much. And, I've said this on a couple podcasts and <clears throat> when I go out to a client, you know, if God said to me, Jason, what's your ideal property? I, I got 200 acres. I'm going to give you, how, how do you want it to lay out? And I said, well, do I get to pick what's on the neighbors too? And he said, yeah, you can pick what's on the neighbor's <laughs> property. So to me, <clears throat> the ideal property, and this is like a lot of my properties is <clears throat> I'd say, okay, give me a property and right smack dab in the middle, we're going to create all the sanctuary, all the bedding. We're never going to go into the middle of this property. And we're going to hunt it from the outside in. And then on my neighbor's property, they have corn and soybeans. And I'm going to get <laughs> yeah. between, right? I'm going to get that. Those are the destination sources. I'm going to plant a whole bunch of quarter acre, eighth acre, half acre plots that are between these food sources where these bucks are going to feel comfortable traveling to the destination sources in daylight hours. And it's going to be thick and it's going to be grown up around. They're going to feel comfortable coming into this plot in daylight hours before they head out to those destination sources. So that's, that's just me. That's, that's, that's how I, you know, if I, if I had the ideal layout and God said, Hey, that's your, but it, but it comes down to what you were saying that there's a lot of things that go into this and, you know, and it's, I think it's important before guys go and they, and they start, you know, whacking down half their trees and that you do have a plan, right? You can screw your property up, you know, Absolutely. and you can, you can, you can screw it up pretty easy and you can do things that man may never be fixed in your lifetime. You know, I've been on some of those properties and it's like, why, why did you do this? And well, this is Absolutely. what the last guy told us to do, you know? And it's like, oh man, you know, and, and I wish I had a, had an easy solution for you, but, um, but yeah, you, you got, you do have to be careful. And, and I want to get in and I want to talk a, a little bit about, you know, 
like we said, uh, you know, we're going to talk hinge cutting, we're going to talk uh, hack and squirt. But I wanted to ask you, or I, I want to talk about uh, select cutting and clear cutting. So guys mm -hmm. really understand the difference in that as well. But I get I, I, I go to a lot of properties and you hear a lot now when it comes to cover on switchgrass, um, giant mis miscanus, um, you know, people, yeah. people plant pine, you know. And, <laughs> yep. and so to me, like I always I'm, I'm hesitant to, to, to tell guys what to do with those kinds of things, because there's so many different options. They all have, you know, White Tone Institute, which is which is everybody knows is one of my sponsors. They have a product called Conceal, but it's only it's only an annual, you know, mm -hmm. so you got to you got to temporary solution to a permanent problem a lot of times now like let's say you're growing a row of pines and you want to grow that you know while that's establishing that you know that might be a be a use for it and things like that but <clears throat> a lot of times when i go in to a property and i used to be this guy i love to mow like i thought a beautiful oh. wide open <laughs> field and we'd get the mower out and we're just mowing the side of hills and oh look how beautiful we'll be able to see these deer walking in from 300 yards away it's going to be great and i realized pretty early on to put the mower away. Now I use a mower a lot for my food plots and, and mowing past to my food plots, but that's it as far as anything around that. But you know, a guy that's had a, a piece of ground where, it, where it was just mowed, what are the things they can do to, to get that to grow up? You know, I tell them just, just let it grow. And I've had other people say, I'll just go in and disc it up once, you know, bring up all that weed seed, you know, l just let it start growing and get thick and nasty. Like what have you found in your, you know, you know, things that you do and look at and property that you look at when you run into a situation like that, that, oh, man, hey, they just had this field that they were just mowing to mow it, right? Or maybe they did hay, but they're not interested in it. They just did hay to keep it, keep it mowed. What do you tell a guy in that particular situation to do with a field like that? So depends on what's growing in the field, number one. Um, that's kind of the baseline. So let's say it's a, a pasture grass like fescue, very common across the eastern United States or in the, in the deep south. Maybe we're looking at a bahia grass um, type pasture. In that case, we just don't let it go because it's, it's never going to get to where you need it to be. You, we may have to drop a little bit of herbicide love on it to uh to really get rid of that weed uh composition and i'm what i'm gonna say weed is the fescue or bahia grass right because ultimately if we're trying to grow whitetails that is not the food source you want and so we got to remove that so in that case uh i would do an herbicide burn and maybe even a light disking uh that would be in late summer into fall and the reason why okay. i would do all that and it's, this might be a multi-year process. This is just kind of the quick and dirty. But the reason why is disturbance in late summer into fall, you tend to get your best weed composition and especially a lot of good uh, native legumes that will come back up. And if you're trying to grow deer and you want other species, that disturbance timing is very good. I've worked with guys that, that's been on, let's say, a budget for trying to grow whitetail. Remember a gentleman they had about a thousand acres and like, Hey, we're trying to budget. What do I need to do? And I said, well, I tell you what, you got this big field here. Let's grow some ragweed. And he's like, why do we want to grow ragweed? And I said, well, it has some of the, the highest digestible, digestible crude protein uh, of native plants. And I said, if we come in here in September and we disc it this certain week, there's about a two week window. And I said, I bet you almost your entire field will come up in ragweed. He's like, you're kidding me. Why do I want to do that? I said, just, just bear with me. I said, I want you to come back on the other half of your field. Now, this was an old field. It didn't have any fescue in it, and we're just trying to manage it, right? And so he's on a budget, and I said, hey, let's try this. So he did. Uh, he waited two weeks later, come back, hit the other half, and it was almost 80% partridge pea that came up. A really nice, high-quality legume. Had some butterfly milkweed, some other things that – butterfly pea, excuse me, that came in, and I was like, whoa, this looks good. So when he came back the next year, he's like, man, it looks like somebody has flat mowed my field. And I said, the deer are annihilating it. You got a great native food source. And so this is all about putting that smorgasbord of food out there. So there's a lot of things you could do with disturbance. Uh, I've used roller choppers before in certain uh, situations where you just want a little bit of ground disturbance to get the weed community coming up. But if I was to disturb the ground, ideally, ideally that late summer into fall, the fall, Dr. Craig Harper, um, great individual. Um, I have to uh, sing my, my my orange here, you know, with the School of Natural Resources. And, I mean, Craig really knows habitat. He's one of the uh, folks I got to study under when I was there years ago. 
And, yeah. and basically, we know that if we do that disturbance timing at that time of the year, we're going to have a great weed community. And that weed community is what whitetails want. Yeah. Yeah. So when you do that, so, you know, you got a field, you know, you come in and, and you mow it, spray it, kill it, then then just disc it in the in the late summer, early fall. Yeah. You know? So it depends on what it is. Once again, if it's if you got a lot of every field's different, if it's pasture grasses, I'm going to get rid of the pasture grasses first so everything else can come up. And uh, let's say one of the projects I worked on some years ago on public ground, I was over on land between the lakes, uh, nestled in between Kentucky and Tennessee, and we're restoring. I basically end up managing almost all of their open land fields, okay? Pretty cool project. And I was going in, and they had basically just pasture grasses in all their fields. I'm like, let's do something about this. And it was really cool because uh, everyone locally are like, man, we'd like to have more clover and other things. I'm like, Listen, we can do that. We can do some natives. But we went in and did an herbicide treatment. Sometimes we'd come back and do a spot treatment. So we come in when that grass is really, you know, aggressively growing. We hit it. And then uh, then what I like to do is prescribe burn over it. But if I couldn't, then basically what we did was just lightly harrowed or chopped over it. Either way, and we do that later in the summer. And then next year, man, the weed communities was just mind-blowing. Um, yeah. So... We, uh, we brought a lot of these natives in. I've been on other sites uh, where, let's say, um, let's say you're in, a, you're in a heavy, dense pine, heavily managed pine forest, okay, where it's neck-to-neck -neck pine trees. And I had a guy that was raking for pine straw for years. And the ground was depleted of the seed bank. And I said, okay, this is what we may have to do. We have to be innovative. Unless you want to come here and plant something, Let's see what's down in the seed bank. And basically, we got a deep arrow and lifted the dirt up from down below and dumped it over. And we brought that native seed bank back to the top. Some of these native seeds were, will persist for anywhere from 20 to 100 years. And so what we did is we flipped it. And all of a sudden, he's like, dude, I've never seen anything like it. It's greening up again. I'm like, yeah, we brought those seeds back to the top. And then he had this like really nice habitat again. And so all of a sudden he's like, man, I'm plowing in between all these rows. And that's what he had to do, man, just to bring the seed bait back. So it depends on the situation. Each one's a little different. You just have to look at it, see what's best for you, and then then make it happen. Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's get into to timber stuff. And and real quick, if you just take a little bit, I think most guys understand this, but maybe just explain the difference between a clear cut and a, and a select cut, you know, what, what sure. are the differences of the two of those? Um, when, when a guy's looking at taking timber off his property, listen, a clear cut looks like my head, right? We're going to wipe it all off and it's going to be thinned out to nothing. Okay. So, yep. it's so for anybody like not this. watching this, for anybody <laughs> not watching this on, on, on YouTube and they're, they're listening to it. Um, the other Jason, he doesn't have a lot of hair on the top of his head. So, <laughs> Hey man, I'm aerodynamic. Let's just say that. And I've been that way for a few years. So, uh, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you're basically removing all your trees. You may, you may leave a few snags, dead trees in there, but overall it's complete. Like we're starting over, uh, on a select thinning and there's a lot of different, um, terminology for what kind of thing that may be. You're going in and taking out so many trees per acre, removing those. And it could be a patchwork effect. It could be some areas are heavier than others. But the whole goal is to try to put more sunlight to the ground, uh, to, tr to to provide enough room for these trees to grow. You want their crowns, depending on the species, to maybe to move on out. And we know that if we remove selectively remove trees around some of our key mass producers, uh, it's going to pr provide a lot of opportunity for mass production to really increase. And that's that's very valuable if we're trying to grow quality whitetails. Sure. Sure. And <clears throat> I was on a piece the other day. I, I haven't went on a ton of pieces where they've done a lot of clear cutting, but I was on one the other day and good grief was it thick and gnarly. And he's like, here's my favorite spot to hunt. And I mean, he was right in the middle of all of it. And I was like, <laughs> well, yeah, you need to be careful, but man, I understand why, you know, he's like, I see yeah. a lot of deer in here. And, and so, you know, I think, you know, you tell me if I'm wrong to put it in real simple terms, you know, a select cut, you're simply just going and, and you're not, taking all the trees you know you're Correct. just you're simply selecting the ones that are maybe junk trees or or you know or, or or they're mature they're ready to come out you know you're getting light to the to the floor clear cuts where you're taking everything and 
I think what people need to understand in all of these things, and, and we talked about this a little bit before the show, when when you have a cover issue, the the, the biggest issue that I run into is, is everybody wants instant gratification. They want their property to be awesome, right? Like that year. <laughs> and and that's the one kind of nice thing with food plots, right? If we're, if we're doing food right. plots, and I said, if I get the, you know, the ideal client calls me and says, hey, man, I got my whole property is full of cover. You know, we got tons of it. I got 200 acres. And that's great because if you say, hey, I have no cover, we, we got a bigger problem that's going to take longer. If you, if you have a lot of cover, we, yeah, we can come in and strategically get food plots in and, and, and do things to, that can help benefit that right away. But anytime you have a cover issue, so regardless if you decide to select cut or clear cut, I mean, I've even seen guys and it, and it really worked out well. And I don't think they did it on purpose where they had a portion of it that was clear cut, right? You know, because mm -hmm. that's going to grow in and tell me if I'm wrong, a clear cut's going to grow in the thickest of anything. You know, I mean, that that's going to come back really thick, gnarly, um, even more so than a, than, a, than a select cut will. And man, they had it. So, you know, I've, I've been on properties where they had a portion, you know, they had 10 acres that was was clear cut and the rest was select cut. And man, it was all thick. But where that clear cut was, man, super, super thick. And so like, you know, I, I guess just the point is, is guys understand when you do this, you know, it doesn't grow back thick overnight either. Right. You know, what, what are you looking at before you really start seeing that like two, three, four years, you know, where it really starts to kind of settle in? It depends on your site, man. It, it all comes down to your dirt, really. And so um, if you're in really high quality dirt, then uh, that growth rate, you might see things if you're in the deep south, uh, really high quality dirt in some place in the Midwest within a couple of years, it's going to get pretty thick. Um, in other areas where the, the quality of the dirt, you start getting the more sandy soil types in general, um, it, you'll find that it may be three to five years before it really starts thickening up. And so it just depends on your, your, your soil type, where you're located um, in the United States, because all of that plays a factor in how quickly it'll get to where you want it to be. And yeah. then it's a matter of how do I manage enough of that over time so that it's really quality, you know, and something for a lot of people that out there that's thinking about maybe harvesting timber, thinking about uh, a partial clear cut or I say partial clear cut, where you're going to do maybe uh, some clear cuts on your property, um, patchwork thinnings, et cetera. I mean, in general, you need about 30 acres uh, of property in order to do something, or you need to have a neighbor willing to go in with you as a cooperative. If not, it's going to be really hard to get someone out to do the work unless it's going to start costing you. And so keep that in mind. Uh, everyone has different acreages out there. And, and depending, depending on how you put that together, construct that, uh, it can help you move wood at the correct times so that it maximizes the benefits for the habitat. And so even the timing of harvest can be helpful for you in giving somebody a, a, you know, a leg up to get you there a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit now about, you know, some of the other things, hinge cutting, hack and squirt, different things like that. Well, you know, maybe explain, you know, because those are the buzzes that you see in the whitetail world, right? You know, right. so maybe explain what those two are and how they work and why to do them and why maybe not to do them. And, you know, again, why you have to be careful doing something like that. Maybe just talk a little bit about each of those and, and what the benefits are. i tell you what, I mean, it's this, this work can be uber complicating. Uh, but, but honestly, you know, if, if you, the landowner, you have time to get out there and want to have a little bit of fun. Um, number one, if you're doing a hack and squirt, uh, I've done a lot of large hack and squirt projects, uh, in the Eastern U S uh, in the Midwest. And what I've seen is you got to be extremely careful with the type of herbicide you use. Okay. Because, uh, you could use the wrong type of herbicide and you may go in and go, man, I did a great job removing one or two of these trees I didn't want, but if it's the wrong kind of herbicide, herbicides emit back through the roots or through the leaves. Some, uh, have a dirt time that may be very bad uh, for quote unquote uh, multiple other species that you want to keep. So you got to be careful, but a hack and squirt, you're simply going in there, you're, you're, you're hacking around the, uh, the tree. You're, you're trying to cut through that thin cambium layer. You're going to spray a little bit of herbicide in there and move on. And they have some really cool innovative techniques, whether it's, it's just with your typical hatchet or they even have these really cool 22 injectables. Boom. And uh, you can basically inject herbicide into the tree in multiple spots. It's almost like with a bang stick. Very yeah. effective, simple to do. Uh, you can do that to remove invasive species. 
It may be that you have, let's say you have some type of softwood species that has zero impacts or it's not really good for whitetail. You could go in and remove some of those and, and really help your neighboring trees do a little bit better, help put more sunlight to the ground, you name it. Uh, those hinge cuts, I mean, that's getting out there and doing a little bit more uh, of the labor, so to speak. You know, you're going out there and, and most people are doing it with a chainsaw, having to drop that tree. You're trying to create really just little patchworks of where you're, you're trying to create maybe areas of cover, uh, being very selective where this may be a future bedding area. Or for some cases, if, if people are managing for multiple species, it may be an area where uh, where maybe you see a bobwhite quail or a, a or hen turkey trying to escape getting up underneath these trees. And so there's a lot of other benefits to uh, these types of quote unquote management styles, but uh, overall those are tough. Now, if you were to go in and have your property thinned out and using a consultant, the consultant and a forester, you may be able to achieve all this and not have to put as much sweat equity in. But if you like to do some sweat equity, this is where some of these things come into play for sure. 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 So let me ask you a, just a, a scenario. We, I think we we address this a little bit, but going back to clear cutting and select cutting, and it sounds like you know the majority of the time when you you talk to somebody, you fall or lean way more to to select cutting than than clear cutting. And and I think I'm reading you right. Is there ever a time where you say, yeah, this makes sense to you know, especially a guy who's who's not interested in the timber value, who says, man, I'm just interested in the best whitetail habitat I can get. Is there a time that that clear cutting then from that perspective is 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 better for you or 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 not really? You're, you you know what are your thoughts on that? I I think there is. I mean, once again, it's every property is different and every landowner is different, and depending on objectives, what's there. Um, I, I've oftentimes used some clear cuts even around an area where I was going to put an opening in. Okay, and trying to put everything together and go, hey, this is going to be your hot spot you know, late season. I want you to reserve this spot. It's going to be, I'm going to put cover and right beside a nice opening and, and just stay away from it, right? We're going to protect that. Uh, but there's other times where it depends on the tree species. Let's say it's a, a type of, there's some oak species we're seeing that are uh, going through sudden oak death. Um, they're hitting that maturity level where they have to be removed. Maybe it's uh, down here where we're having some uh, issues with, with several kinds of um, pests, so to speak, that are impacting um, like ash, for example. We with have the, that. Uh, with the ash borer, right? Yep. And so I, I, you know, I met with a landowner. I'm like, look, this ash is probably about to go away. Let's go ahead and consider clear cutting some of these areas. And then we'll make these your, your really good cover spots. And so every situation is different. It may be uh, piney woods, and we're trying to remove some of that, trying to restore some other types of species in there. But yeah, there's a, I think the playbook is wide open. Uh, but what I would recommend not to do is like, hey, I'm just going to clear cut my whole property. There may be a time for that. But in most instances, uh, I can tell you that's usually your, your last card to pull on the table. Yeah. Um, but yeah, clear cuts are a part of the, uh, the story. And they may be small patchwork or they may be a little bit larger. It depends on the property size. Once again, the, the layout of uh, what's around you. And so I like to look at all that. It's it's kind of like painting a picture, man. Um, a lot of people can kind of joke around me like, what do you mean? You're an artist? I'm like, yes, I'm a, I'm a habitat artist, and I'm going to try to paint you the best picture so you're going to enjoy this thing. But, man, it's like a puzzle when you start doing it. And so if you put the right puzzle pieces together, gosh, it's just gorgeous afterwards, but you got to be able to see it ahead of time. And a lot of people just don't realize that. Yeah. I tell, it's funny you say gorgeous. I, I tell, I've told guys this numerous times, you know, they say, well, my wife, she really likes the woods and she likes to be able to walk through these wide open woods and it's so pretty. And I said, listen, <laughs> I found ugly is way more attractive to whitetail than pretty woods. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, you, man. The, absolutely. The, the, <laughs> you know, like I told before, like I used to mow and oh, look how pretty this all looks. When I learned to just start letting stuff go and get thick and get nasty, you know, that's when you, you really get serious. So the guy that says, oh, I just want a beautiful, pristine, well mowed and manicured property and wide open woods that we can ride the horses through. Well, uh, I don't know if whitetail is going to be your, uh, going to be. I agree, thing. man. It, it's, you know, uh, this is like a, a crazy culture discussion, but think about it. We grow up in a, 
most people are growing up in a neighborhood. You're driving down the road. You, you know, you're going to a city somewhere to get your groceries. Everything is clean and manicured, okay? So from day one, you're growing up 95% of, of humanity. This is what we're seeing. You know, our desks are square. And, and so, and then we go out here into these wild places, man. And then we're talking about trying to make this look kind of disturbed. And I think, man, the psyche of people's like, no, that's bad automatically. And so unfortunately for us, because the world we live in, we got to like break those barriers. And so it's so funny, man, even in my yard, like I got a bunch of deer in my yard, like all the time. And, and my wife sometimes like, gosh, why do you, why do you put like a food plot in our backyard? I'm like, well, cause I enjoy seeing the deer and drinking coffee and watching them. Right. And you know, like, but yeah, but this looks like weeds. I'm like, well, those are great weeds. Right. Yeah. And so it, it's pretty cool, man. It's just trying to accept you know, that this kind of behavior or change in, in how we manage things is actually good. And man, for whitetails, as, as everyone knows, they're edge species. So the more edge we have, the better. And so when I think about like clear cuts and things, this is why I like to think about thinning because man, we could do like linear thinnings and other things and we can maximize how much edge we have because I want those critters moving all around my track that I'm hunting on. Yeah. And I'm sure everyone out there wants the same. Yeah. And so trying to think about it that way and going, Oh, I want these, I want these whitetails to stay here and never leave. That's the goal. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. the goal. I'm going to be greedy. Okay. I'm going to be greedy. Yeah. Um, but, um, uh, but that's part of it. But if everyone was doing it, it'd be great. Right. Yeah. So, um, I, I tell guys so yeah, that man. all, yeah, I tell guys that all the time too, you know, spe especially smaller acres, you know, 200 acres and less, which is, is a lot of my clients, you know, is, is fall in that range. And they all know is, is like, Hey, we're, we're not going to hold a whitetail here a hundred percent of the time. But the goal is, can we make this his core area that he's here 90% of the time or he's here 85% <laughs> right. of the time. He's not going over to, you know, Bob's name, you know, the neighbor Bob and getting shot that you're up in your odds of, of holding that deer. You're giving him everything that he needs that he wants to be here in the rut. He wants to, he feels safe in this area. This is his core area. What are the things that we can do? And, and obviously that's why we're sitting here talking about, you know, timber improvement and cover because it's just a huge, huge deal. And, you know, this is, and then I want to get in and talk a little bit turkeys with, because I know you want to talk turkeys, but just to kind Absolutely. of wrap, wrap up the, the timber um, side of, of the podcast, you know, I, I want to say to guys, you know, you, you can hurt yourself. You know, I've been on properties where man, you know, there was, they had a different consultant in and, and he came in and I don't even think he put, he, he was on the property. He just looked at the top of map and said, clear these three acres, clear these three acres and clear these. And he took out all this wonderful cover. And I'm just like, man, I, you know, I don't want to ever bad mouth the competition or anybody, but I don't know what he was doing here other than just looked at it from a computer and said, gave you a cookie cutter solution. I think you hit the nail on the head. There are no cookie cutter solutions. And so if you're looking at these things, you're looking at like, okay, I got, I have a cover issue. You know, I'm just speaking, you know, from my end as a, as a, you know, a, a food plot consultant and coming in and looking at it. I like to come in, you know, you have a guy like me come in first. We know we're going to, to, to select cut this or, or, you know, or, or clear cut some sections, but I can come in and give some overall suggestions. And then I can say, Hey, I know you got a company coming in. that's going to be doing some select cutting. I want to put a, food plot here. Here's where I want the access. <clears throat> Here's where I want the really thick stuff on the property and, and, and things like that. So then you, you, and I tell guys, when you talk to a timber company or a forester, or I encourage a forester, I encourage you to do that because guys like you have a certain level of knowledge and we say, yeah, Hey, this is why we want to do this. This is why we want to do that. We're going to take this over here. But also these guys will compete for your business. You know, I, I say, don't just go with the first timber guy that stops by. And, and the nice thing with having a guy like me in first, it's going to save you a ton of work because we can say, Hey, you know, this half acre section here, we want completely cleared, right? Push the stumps off, get it all out, you know, drag the topsoil back on, make that as part of your deal, you know, because these timber companies, if you have enough ground, you have enough timber, they're going to compete for your, your business. So you're looking at, okay, what, how much money are you going to get for your timber? But then also will somebody work with you in making it exactly the way that you want to within reason, you know, with, within Absolutely. reason that you're not like, you know, like coming up with all kinds of crazy things, but Hey, you know, they got to have a way in and out and yeah, that's no big deal. We can, we can push off a, a trail to there and, you know, we can clear that quarter acre plot for you. No problem. You know, we'll just, we'll take all that out. 
So I tell guys, you know, when you're looking at doing this, you know, is, is to not just willy nilly, you know, maybe you don't need a guy like me come in. You already know where you want all your food and where you want your sanctuary and you want your cover and things like that. So maybe you skip that step, but make sure you're talking to more than one timber guy as well, you know, get, get two or three guys in there, get the best price, see if they'll work with you on, on clearing the property and doing the things that you need to. But that's, that's just always my advice to guys. And I just, I want to get your thoughts on that. If, if that's telling guys the right things, if you'd tell them the same thing. No, I agree. Um, I always get, um, you know, when you're having someone come in and and because when you make this, this is a, a, a lifetime kind of epic day when this happens because usually once you cut those trees, they ain't going to be back for a while. And so it's, it's a big decision. So plan it out, take your time. Don't get in a hurry, get multiple bids every time. If the bids still suck, it's okay. Unless you really got to have money at the moment, you can be patient. You can play the market as well. And so there's a lot of just small things you can do. Having a consultant forester marking trees, there's a lot of things to do to make sure it's going to be done right the way you want it to, because ultimately it's your property. Don't get too caught up on the financials. As soon as someone sees a little bit of money waved in front of them, they go, Oh man, this is awesome. Slow down, ghost man, slow down. That's right. Let, let's talk about how we're going to do this. And oftentimes you're going to have much better results. So be very patient and uh, have a plan in place and work with a professional up front, just like yourself or myself and others out there. You know, if someone says, hey, I I got a background as a biologist, as a forester, I've been doing this for X amount of years, check up on them, go, hey, send me your resume. So get some intel up front and then plan this thing out. And I tell you what, uh, you can really make your own dream property happen. Yeah, for sure. And and that's why I tell guys and and, and make sure, you know, it's funny to me and you probably see it is is you see land management consultants popping up all over the place now, right? You know, guys that they planted a food plot at their house and it grew and now they're going <laughs> to go do property. And I, I'm not trying to, you know, but it, but it scares me because it gives everybody a bad name. And, and I tell people yep. when you're looking at this, it's like anything else, you know, and, and I tell people if, you know, your goal at the end of the day, and I, I firmly believe this, I, I really focus on the Northeast part of the country, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, Uh, Michigan, you know, some of the New England states and things like that. That's really, that's my, my wheelhouse, you know, and, and most guys are calling and and where I'm good and I'm upfront with guys is I've, I've been successful at killing big bucks, big mature bucks in states not known for big mature bucks, you know, and, and consistently doing that with, with, with the habitat improvement strategies and things that I've done. But I tell people up front, I'm not your timber guy. I'm not your forest guy, but I, I understand and appreciate the need for those guys. So I'm always like, Hey, we need to talk to somebody about this, you know, and, and so you, you you need to make sure you're working with somebody that's going to be upfront with you. They're going to be honest with you. And they, they, at the end of the day, I always say, I want happy clients, right? I want, I want guys Absolutely. that are telling their buddy, this guy did me right. Right. He was up front with me. He yep. didn't come in and screw up my ground because you can screw up your property. You absolutely you can. can. You get you, you get the, you get the wrong guy in there. It's just like, yeah, man, he's all about the timber value, and he's just going to take everything he can get. And so it's important, really important, especially especially when you're looking at it from a from a whitetail perspective, right? That oh, that gosh, you are yeah. having you know more than one guy in there. Get somebody that you that you trust that you know you can check his references and and get somebody. I always say this, you know get somebody that's accomplishing the goals that you want to accomplish. So if you're in Northwest yep. Pennsylvania and you want to shoot big mature bucks by somebody that's doing, well, then find somebody from the Northeast part of the country that's shooting big mature bucks and doing these things, right? Same thing with, with these timber companies, find ones. There's guys out there that say, Hey, I've worked with whitetail habitat guys, you know, and, and guys like yourself, right. That really look at these kinds of things. Those guys are out there. So make sure you talk to the right guys. You find the right people do not screw up your property, but, that all being said, like I said, I go out in a lot of consults and I tell guys when they say to me, what, what, what should I do with my, my, my timber and my woods? And I said, listen, you got a lot of mature timber in here and I'm not going to start going and marking trees and telling you what to cut, but I've never seen a property from a whitetail habitat perspective hurt by having a, 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 a select cut done, you know, like, I mean, everywhere, right. but that being said, you need to talk to somebody. And I mean, I've, I've left con- consults and they literally had timber guys in there that same day, you know, like they had cards of yeah. people stopping by and, and, and started talking about the process and stuff. So, so yeah, so I just, you know, I'll let you <clears throat> maybe give some advice on that, but that's why I just tell guys is be careful, 
but you need to do it. Make sure you talk to more than one. Make sure they understand what you want out of your property and say, hey, the guy who's going to get this job is the guy who's going to give me the best price, who I feel comfortable with, who is going to help me out with certain areas that I want to clear and maybe a few paths and, and is willing to work with me along the property. That's what that's what you're looking for. So that's just my advice to guys. And I'll let you kind of chime in on any advice you have when guys are, are looking at getting into this and doing something with their timber. Absolutely. Uh, you've hit on most of them. The other things I'd say is always have a contract, um, contract, 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 do not handshake contract. Um, and then whoever you're working with, make sure they're reviewing over that contract to help you. Cause this is a, a time to lay it out correctly on maybe where you want to have your, your load index. What do you want to do with the tops? What do you want to do with this, with stump fields? I mean, there's all these other things that you can build into your contract, working with the, the correct forester consultant logger to do this correctly. And, and I'll be honest with you, I've even had loggers that I've been out with on site and they've stopped. They, they've been in a, uh, a bunch of feller. They get out and they come over. Hey, Jason, I was really thinking about, you know, making this finger a little longer as I think it might be. I'm like, you know what? That's a great idea. Let's do that. You know, and so when you get guys like that that understand it and they're thinking about whitetails the same way you are, you're like, yeah, I, I, I like that idea because none of us uh, have the perfect solution, but we're trying to recommend the best thing for people to do. So when you get the right people together, great things happen every time. That's right. That's right. For sure. So, so yeah, so I specifically left. We got about five minutes or so left. I specifically wanted to talk Turkey with you. I know, I know that's what you right. want to talk about. So we got Turkey season coming up. I'm, I'm actually going to be heading to Kentucky here. I, I film a series uh, for the Kentucky department of fish and wildlife called strutting in yeah. the bluegrass. Um, we film oh, yeah. the first five days and it's, it's a, it's a hoot. I love, <clears throat> I love Turkey hunting. I do it every day, but talk a little bit about your organization, um, you know, what, what your job is there with your, your foundation that you're doing and, you know, a little bit about, about what you're doing there. Sure, man. Um, uh, so, uh, I'll just have to put it out there. So I, I got the disease, right? It's bad. And so I've already had to travel South to begin my spring. I'm based out of Kentucky, um, uh, myself. Um, but I had to go down to Florida and put one of those black barred, uh, Osceola's into the bag to start my season which is a fantastic thing. So I will start traveling and, uh, and chasing springs, they say. But I work for, the Tur for uh, Turkish for Tomorrow. Uh, we've been around for just a little over three years. And the whole reason why we uh, come on board was to address wild turkey decline. There's a pretty big issue going on. Um, we started talking about this behind the scenes, a bunch of us biologists back in 2012, 2013. And so it's, it's hit some uh, pretty bad levels in some states. And so this organization stepped in and said, hey, we're going to try to turn this around. What can we do? Uh, because we do not want to have a silent spring. And so this is where we are. We're here to, uh, to basically look at how do we save the wild turkey using science-based solutions for long-term sustainability. It's pretty simple. And so uh, we're looking at doing some uh, wild turkey uh, private lands cooperatives, actually. Uh, we're taking a play out of the playbook from Quality Deer Management Association, the Brian Murphy days back in the day, and uh, and trying to bring people together, really thinking about how do we manage turkeys in a landscape. So there's a lot to be done. Um, I'm working on our partnerships, business operations, kind of a jack of all trades, a master of many <laughs> at the moment. And so uh, it's good. We have a small team. We're growing really fast. Uh, and actually I think we even have a chapter two, uh, that have developed up your way in Pennsylvania. Okay. So, uh, so it's pretty cool, man. We're growing, we're up to about 28 chapters at the moment nationwide. And, um, and we're still, uh, just hammering away. Yeah. Do me a favor <clears throat> after the show, send me the, the information. How can people find out? So one, how can, and I found this too, in my years, I'm, I, I got the Turkey bug too. I love, it. I don't, we have, where I'm at, I'm fortunate in Pennsylvania. We have, we have some phenomenal Turkey hunting. I, I go to Kentucky. I used to go to Wisconsin and, and travel around and do a lot, but I just found I do a ton of hunting. I'll, I'll take kids out and then I'll take, you know, I'm, I'm hunting every day Absolutely. for, for turkeys in, in Pennsylvania. And I agree with you. You know, we've, we've certainly been seeing in, in certain areas, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, a decrease in, in my opinion, right? I, I'm not a wildlife biologist. I'm not an expert. I don't want to pretend to be, but it's been enough for me to be like, there aren't as many turkeys is, 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 is what we used to have. And, but I have found, you know, um, you know, on, on properties that, 
deer habitat and turkey habitat a lot of times can go hand in hand. And you probably know more about turkey habitat than, than I do and, and ideal things that you can do. But, um, you know, that might be a whole other podcast where we, we might just do a, a turkey oh, show. We, we need to have a whole podcast of differentiating deer and turkey habitat because yep. a lot of it overlaps, but a lot of it, if I'm trying to just 100% manage for turkeys, we got to take a different approach. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so tell people where can they find out? Can people be individual members or how does your Absolutely. organization work? Um, and, you know, say somebody wants to start a chapter, talk a little bit about where people can find more out more information about the, the organization and how they might be able to help. Yeah, absolutely. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, you can uh, go to turkeysfortomorrow.org. Uh, you can be found online. We have a very strong uh, social media platforms on Facebook, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, TikTok, you name it. You can find us pretty easily. You just search for us. You can hashtag pound for turkeys uh, and you'll find us uh, there or turkeys for tomorrow. And uh, if you want to start a chapter or if you're interested in becoming a member, we are a membership organization. We didn't intend to be, but we had people going, hey, we want to be a member and we want to have chapters. Yeah. And so uh, you can go online, turkeysfortomorrow.org. Uh, you can look at uh, become a member, hit join button and boom, uh, become a member just like that. It's fast and easy. Uh, start a, a chapter. All we need for you to do is fill out an application. And once again, uh, on our website, it's very easy to find. Once you click on it, um, you just fill out a, a few things about yourself, what you do, make sure you're not a felon or something. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, we'll reach out to you, connect with you and try to bring people together. And so our approach is a little different. Uh, we're, we're having, uh, we're bringing people together in kind of fun events first. And so we're having social events where maybe we get together and have a few uh, tasty suds or maybe in the great state of Kentucky, maybe we do some bourbon tasting or something just to get people together and get them in line. And then if they want to go further from there, we let them go. Yeah, perfect. So, so yeah, so you got the website, you got all that. I appreciate Jason, you very much being on the show. Like I said, this was our first really, you know, I've been doing these podcasts now. This is, I think the fifth year I said I've been doing, I do 14 yeah. every year. I do seven in the spring Holy moly. and seven in the <laughs> fall. So I do 14 every yeah. year. And this was the first that we really got after timber, you know, and talked about it. just, it's just cause it's not my wheelhouse. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not an expert right, in right. it. And, and so it was great to have you here. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to everybody. And I hope everybody got something out, out of this show. Um, I, I don't care who you are. If, if you're, you know, anybody listening to this is, is a habitat guy, right? So I know That's right. that they got good stuff from this show on and, cutting and, timber is good. If you leave with cutting timber is good. You're going to have a great week yep, for sure. So again, thank you so much for, for being on the show and we'll have to have you back again sometime. Maybe we will do a, a Turkey. We'd have to do it next spring though. Cause, cause I do like spring topics and fall topics. Right. So like we're sure. in the spring session right now and, and I have my, I have two more that I'm recording and they're already scheduled, but, uh, but maybe next spring we'll have you back and we'll do a, a specific Gladly. Turkey, um, you know, Turkey one. And, and we may have you back sometime too, and maybe we'll talk prescribed burns and get more into hinge cutting and hack and squirt and all the, all the other things that you see like that. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll do that sometime as well. I mean, the reality is man, on all these topics, you could do an hour discussion just on hack and squirt because yep. it could be that complicated. Yep. Uh, but, uh, but there's so much stuff to cover when you're out there trying to get your hands a little bit dirty and doing something good for whitetails or whatever critter you're trying to manage. So I can't say enough for, uh, of a thank you to you for uh, having me on today and representing Turkish for tomorrow and, just know, uh, reach out to us if you got some questions and uh, looking forward to uh, doing this again with you. Yep, awesome. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I did what we do want to say thanks to a couple more sponsors here right at the end. And then we're uh, we're going to wrap it up. But thank you again to uh, everybody for uh, for being here and Jason, especially for taking the time and talking to us on a, I got a rainy, drizzly Tuesday morning here. I don't know what it's doing down <laughs> in Kentucky, but I was just in North Carolina right. the last four days and it was like, <laughs> 80 degrees and I get back home in Pennsylvania and it's raining and cold. So <laughs> well, we, we got a front coming through now and uh, uh, we're welcoming some rain because uh, with this warm weather and rain, it's about time to go look for morels. Yep, for sure. There you go. <laughs> yep. All yep. right. Well, again, Jason, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you everybody for listening. I'm going to say thanks to a couple sponsors here and then we're going to wrap it up.
One of the most important things that you can do in helping to hold deer on your property at all times of the year, you hear me preach it all the time, and that's diversity. And usually we're talking about that within our food plots, but I'm happy now that I've really gotten serious about planting trees and putting trees around my food plots, whether it's apple trees, pear trees, chestnut trees. I've partnered with the very best, Whitetail Hill Chestnuts. They're going to be talking me through all the things I need to know when it comes to a, a, an appropriate tree plan for my property and they are the very best. So if you're interested in incorporating trees into your food plots, into your property management, I encourage you to visit their website at whitetailhillchestnuts.com. I plant over 30 acres in food plots every single year and I cannot afford to be losing time with equipment that is not reliable or gets the job done. And I'm proud to have Coons Engineering as my equipment sponsor here at Field Days. Their equipment is built like a tank from their mower that I can create a new plot to mow my perennial plots to their call to packers to the chisel plow that you see me using all the time that i use with just my quad to break ground and plant new food plots if you're looking for good quality food plot equipment i encourage you check out the very best at kunzeng.com